we say. Okay, we're on. Okay. So hi, Sophie. Yeah. Hi, Leslie. So I'm excited about this opportunity to know more about your work. And um, wanted to introduce you a little bit. Leslie Ellis is as a doctorate. She's an author and educator. And she mainly teaches focusing oriented dream work and online and has a specialty around nightmares. And I just learned that she wrote a recent article that's going to be published, right, Leslie? Or... Just came out in the journal Dreaming um, in the March issue uh, for 2023. So um, it was published online a bit earlier, but the official print publication, I just got it in the mail a couple of days ago. It was so exciting to right. finally see that. Ma it was a massive amount of work, this article. Mm. It's, um, it's basically looking at um, how our nervous system generates our nightmares, or th it's a theory um, about why we have nightmares. And it really involves the body. I, I've, I've come to believe that dreaming is a picture of our embodied state and that our nervous system is really implicated in that. And so in treating nightmares, um, there, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, really well proven methods, but they don't really understand what's working when it works or why and so how to improve um, the outcomes when they don't work and so there's a lot of mystery around nightmares and nightmare treatment and so I was trying to the, the title of the article is solving the nightmare mystery and I think that the the nervous Wonderful. system is yeah is the is the missing link is what I've what I've proposed and and then also looking at the polyvagal theory Stephen Porges's work and applying that to the treatment. So learning simple things like calming the nervous system um, first and then going into the dream and letting it um, play forward so that it's more resolved in the person's body. Um, mm. it's, it's been really an interesting process because I am not a medical doctor and a lot of this stuff kind of gets into the realm of physiology beyond my scope. So I did a lot of research and um, put out my best effort and um, really pleased that it, it got accepted and now it's out in the world. So hopefully it will it will spread because included in it is a very detailed protocol on how to treat nightmares using a focusing oriented approach to dream work. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Mm. And where can people have access to this reading, to this article? How so can people... it, it, it's on, um, it's in Dreaming, which is an APA publication. And so you, if you have access through your institution, you can get it um, um, by looking up Solving the Nightmare Mystery by Dr. Leslie Ellis in the journal Dreaming. But mm -hmm. if you don't have access, you have to pay for it. And I'm happy. I've got a, I've got a pre-publication copy that I'm, I'm able to share because it's, it's the, the sort of second last version. And I could send it to people if they wanted me to. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Just get my email address, which I can say on here so that it's available. It's it's drlesliellis.com is my website. Actually, that's the best place to find me. Okay. Just go to Dr. Dr. Ellis. Dr. Leslie Ellis. Leslie Yeah. Yeah, I'll spell it. D-R-L-E-S-L-I-E-E-L-L-I-S.com. So all one word, lowercase, if people are interested in the article. So viewer, viewers who might be interested. Yeah, they can they can contact me through my website. Okay, great, great. And the other thing that you have been doing, you have been a nightmare expert, obviously mm -hmm. through your article. We can get to know more. And a former president of the Focusing Institute. Yes, I was briefly president. I was just an interim person. It was kind of like a summer job. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't really have the uh, bandwidth at the time to, to stay on, but I, I was a vice president and, and on the board of the Institute for, for a few years and really, really enjoyed it. And one of my missions in that, in that work, and I still continue, is getting focusing um, out in the world in a more of a formal way through research and mm -hmm. the one thing I kept was I joined an international group of researchers that are developing 
a um, simplified version of the experiencing scale so that it's easier to do research into focusing. And um, mm -hmm. it's led by Akira Akemi in Japan and it's mm -hmm. almost, we're almost there, we're almost done. So wow. it'll be exciting to publish that and, and hopefully it will encourage more researchers to, to research focusing because it will be a lot simpler. We've made it a lot simpler. That's so great. And it would spread focusing more into the larger world, which mm -hmm. yes. has been so helpful for so many of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's the that's the big um yeah. impetus behind this is to, you know, just make it accessible because mm. the previous experiencing scale. You know what was interesting is not only is it is it kind of cumbersome to to do research with, but it seems that we've evolved, that we're better focusers than we were when that scale was developed because some of the um, the levels are really, um, they've changed and, and we are kind of getting in deeper into experiencing than the way they describe it in that original scale. So I think focusing has evolved since it, um, since this original scale was developed, which is kind of, kind of good, mm. kind of great. Yeah, right. It keeps yeah. moving forward, right? And mm -hmm. definitely was one of our, uh, Jean Jen in the founder's vision, right? That we take it forward, we take it, um, yeah, to yes. as far as we each person want to go with, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Since we are there, do you want to say a little more about the the way you work with Dream, the experiential embodied ways that you address, um, especially disturbing dreams? Absolutely. Yeah, it's my favorite topic. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I started um, my clinical training at Pacifica Graduate Institute. So it's a Jungian oriented school. So my first training was included dream work. So I already um, started with the ability to work with dreams as a therapist. And it's not really a standard part of clinical training anymore. So mm -hmm. one of my um, great missions in in my work is to get dream work to be more accessible to those people who never got the training and want to include it in their practice and personally I don't think I could do my work without being um, able to work with people's dreams I feel like it's that it's that important so I wrote a book um, uh, called a clinician's guide to dream therapy which talks about a method of focusing oriented dream work and experiential dream work. And then very shortly after I finished my master's, I took a two year, my focusing training, I became a focusing oriented therapist. So I've had this way of practicing right from the start, combining focusing and dream work. And I started as a coordinator, you know, maybe five or six years later, just teaching a focus, not just, but teaching a, a two year focusing program in Vancouver, and I did that in the in-person program for, I would say, about 10 years. And then I wanted to get my doctorate. I just wanted to carry on with my education. So I did a, a doctorate, um, my research into treating the nightmares of refugees with, with PTSD and really disturbing nightmares and using a focusing-oriented approach because I wanted to get some um, something in the literature about focusing oriented therapy and this seemed to marry all my interests and so it became my my um, my doctoral project so that's quite an immersion as you can imagine <laughs> into a topic and so with that I became um, kind of an expert in experiential dream work for treating nightmares and mm. I teach that as well and mm. so yeah over the years my method has, I've taken Jen Lin's work and I've written a lot of articles in various book chapters and things about focusing oriented dream work and really trying to be true to what Jen Lin had described in his book, Let Your Body Interpret Your Dreams. And I listened to a couple of his um, courses he offered on dreams through Anne Weiser Cornell and really tried to just say, this is what Jen Lin had to say. But now that I've added this nightmare piece and I've been working with it for many years since, I would say that I've made it my own. Like it's really become uh, a very specific approach to that, that really um, owes a huge debt to Jung and to Jen Lin, but is, is kind of a unique process that has, um, you know, three, per, three specific elements from 
the dream book, but not a lot of the others. I just pulled out the, the, the most experiential ways and mm. put them together. And uh, it's become, I think, you know, I was just reflecting that it's probably now almost become its own method. And um, do you want to name those three ways? Absolutely. So the first one yeah. is finding help in a dream, which is clearly from Jenlin. Jenlin thought that finding and embodying the life force or the help that is in every dream is the whole purpose of dream work. So just to be um, to look around the dream and see what elements really feel like they're carrying life forward energy and finding them. Sometimes it's easy to find them and sometimes it's it's not, but to find that and embody it is the purpose of dream work is what he thought. And once you've done that, you've done, um, you've gotten what you, um, what you need from the dream and you can then uh, go and explore further. But he thought that was the essence of dream work. And I have since sort of um, taking that in, I've used that as the very beginning process for working with dreams is to pick up the help. And, but I've, I continue beyond that because I think of it like, like in trauma work, how you pick up a resource or you want to get somebody feeling um, bolstered by um, some kind of sense of safety or a sense of company or so that they feel like they've got the strength to go into the dark, darker places. So I yeah. think of finding help like that, like picking up the energy in the dream that then enables you to look at the problem or the issue or the darkness or the difficulty. Most dreams present something that's kind of uncomfortable at the very least, and sometimes mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. So this um, simple thing of picking up the help first has really transformed the way I do dream work. And makes it so much more constructive and safe and right. um, surprising in, in a way. So that's the first one, finding help. And then the next one is embodying dream elements, which is in the list of Jenlin's 10 questions. There's 10 questions he asks, and I basically picked three. You know, the help embodying is from Gestalt therapy, from Fritz Perls, and being, he, Fritz Perls said, that everything in the dream is an aspect of ourselves. And mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. I don't mm -hmm. think that the dreams are all about us. They're all totally subjective. I think there's some um, transpersonal elements sometimes in dreams that things that dreams can be about things that are larger than us. But the mm -hmm. process of embodying different aspects of a dream can really give us a sense of a larger self or a larger perspective or just a different perspective, a sense of the other and it helps I think to understand those mysterious dream elements where we, we don't know what they mean um, when I invite people to slide into the subjectivity of an object or a character suddenly um, it very often becomes clear what that person or that object is doing in the dream from the inside it's much mm -hmm. more clear and focusers are really comfortable with this they're very you know very it's very familiar that something is yeah. more um more familiar or more obvious or more clear to us when we when we check it out from the inside yes it sounds like a wonderful way to get in the dream yes embodying an object or something from the dream yeah um, just becoming it and yeah. really hearing it from the person's perspective then yeah actually <laughs> beginning to speak from that dream object's perspective and feeling what it's like to be that. Um, you can do that with many elements in a dream and you can feel how it would open up a dream and give you so many avenues to explore. And so I find that to be a very powerful practice. And yeah. sometimes you can combine these both because if there's a, a, a numinous or wonderfully strong, beautiful animal, say for example, in your dream and you embody it, then you're embodying the help that is in the dream you're feeling the, the strength of that lion or the you know the beauty of the of the tree or whatever it is that that really strikes you as as magical in your dream and um and you can feel their essence and it, it it's it's very interesting how i think jen Lim is right about this the help that's within the dream the kind of strength you pick up specifically is the kind of strength you need to look at the, the the trouble in the dream it's the, it's a very specific it's not it's not generic it's like this particular um kind of strength or life forward energy um is exactly what i need to get over 
the, the hurdle that the dream might be giving me to um to pay attention to right so it feels like this life help force help life life force help energy is like medicine right like medicine it's yeah. the right medicine to unfold the dream and perhaps approach those very uncomfortable or difficult disturbing sometimes even traumatic parts I would yes think exactly mm-hmm. yeah so mm-hmm. and then the final um one is this question uh, from from the dream book called can the dream continue which mm-hmm. is an idea from Jung, um which is dreaming the dream forward or active imagination and there all of these methods are kind of overlapping because when you embody a dream element you are carrying it forward the dream or when you have a conversation with a dream element you're carrying it forward but specifically you can also um this is this is very common um in nightmare treatments they call it rescripting is basically entering into the nightmare often right at the point where it stops because nightmares usually wake us up in the scariest place Mm -hmm. and asking if the dream can continue from there and creating a um a dream ending that's different that that's that's more usually more it's more resolved i don't um suggest people solve it all necessarily but more they they go back into the uh, embodied sense of their dream and pick a when they've got the help with them so pick up the help pick up Mm -hmm. some resourcing pick up some strength and support and then go into the place where the dream gets cut off because we wake up because we're terrified usually and let the dream continue with the help at our side or in inside and Mm. then the dream will carry forward usually to um, a place that feels more resolved Mm. and the interesting thing about it what I found in my research and what's really played out in in research on a similar method called imagery rehearsal therapy where they re-script a dream let it carry forward is that the nightmares will, in my experience, I've treated hundreds now of nightmares, at least hundreds um, in this way that the nightmares never the same after that. And sometimes it just stops. And so something really resolved. Yes, I think so. Well, what I think happens is that when you're having a recurrent nightmare, it's because there's some trauma or some fearful event that's trying to be metabolized and laid down in our memory and in it's very common in post-traumatic stress injury for this um, process to be stuck in a, in a repeat and the dreams to, to recur. And I think what's happening is that the dreams are trying to get to a place of resolution to resolve, but the nervous system gets too, uh, too activated and it wakes the person up. And then the dreams themselves become troublesome and sleep becomes difficult and the whole thing kind of doesn't work the way it should. But if you give someone a sense of comfort, even a little bit of comfort within the nightmare and the path forward for the dream to go, then when they're sleeping, their body will remember there's a way forward. And they'll, I think that they, you know, they'll start to incorporate some of the, some of the things that you work with in the session, things they've Mm -hmm. imagined, especially if they've imagined them richly. And then the dream carries on and doesn't wake them up. I think what happens is that it doesn't scare them enough to wake them up. So they might say, oh, I don't even have that nightmare anymore because when you carry a dream forward all the way through, typically you won't remember it. So I think they're still having it. I think what's happening is that the dreams are now doing their job and integrating the the, the traumatic events and letting the, and because the dreaming process is laying down uh, events that are emotional into long-term memory and mm. this process gets interrupted when the nervous system is is activated too right? activated this is my theory I, I don't know if it's true but this is how i see it that's great wonderful so do you feel like by working in an embodied way it facilitates the body to while we are awake and working with the dream with the helpers and everything it facilitates the embodied experience and the person to really uh, integrate through the body and the body to remember when we are asleep. Yes, I do. Right? I think I think uh-huh. the body then remembers the, body, the path. 
forward. And I, I mean, but it also they do have um, in imagery rehearsal therapy. It's it's a it's it's basically a similar process, but more of a cognitive approach. It's it's based on cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy steps where they um, invent a new ending and then rehearse it in their mind um, before they go to sleep, and that can be effective too. But I feel like the experiential steps, the ones I've added that are a, a different from IRT, are actually really important ones. Because I think when we experience something deeply, not think, I know this is true, that we remember it um, much more readily, that it, that, that it becomes um, embedded in us in a way that uh, thoughts do not. And in fact, our thinking brain is not really online so much when we're, when we're dreaming. We're, we're more in a more embodied state where our emotional system and our visual system, um, these other parts of us that are more more uh, in in being used than our prefrontal cortex our thinking brain is actually very much asleep that's why mm. we're always um logistical things don't usually figure very well in dreams or if we are trying to do something that's a logic in a logical order we get confused yeah because that part right. of our brain is just yeah. not it's not operational yeah. but the this, yeah yeah and this experiential way of working um in a way it to me when I'm experiencing something and if I'm remembering something I've experienced then it feels more real that if I have been thinking about it or rehearsing something but it stayed in the realm of the thinking brain um, for some reason when I experience it it feels like it's more real and I'm not sure it's because there is more the thinking brain that's also integrated with a other ways of uh, being and thinking and understanding and living. Um, so I, there has been studies on this as well, that when you deeply and richly experience something, your brain doesn't distinguish that from reality. In fact, like it feels very real mm -hmm. to us. And so if you imagine something really deeply, it's as if it really happened. And so you're almost like, changing the traumatic event by richly imagining a, a, a different experience and obviously you're not changing what really happened but you are changing your body's experience of what really happened and that is actually what memory does memory doesn't actually lay down accurate pictures memories are always is shifting and changing and the 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 um, problem in 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 post-traumatic stress injuries not that there, the memory isn't isn't working it's working too well the the the, the trauma is remembered too clearly and too exactly oh. um and what memory often does is it it it, it, sh it lays down images in associative networks and softens the edges of things and you know like and and that isn't in in post-traumatic stress that isn't what's happening and the dreams i think help this so it's like we're trying to make that process happen the way it would if it wasn't um you know over overwhelmed and mm -hmm. and then yeah our memories are are um the, the the further we get away from them the the less accurate they are but the more helpful they are if that makes sense yes that makes sense so i'm struck by when you say if we imagine them imagine this deeply because the that word deeply feels like so it's so we bring it down, right? That's often the way we talk as focuses, mm -hmm. right? We're bringing down to the center of our body. Do you want to say a little bit what you mean when you said imagine deeply and how is the experiential body oriented ways coming into that? Yes. Yeah, so what I um all of the methods that I have picked up from you know from Jenlin and from Jung um and my own work in focusing is. Uh, to deepen the actual experience of dreaming. And this is whether I'm working with a nightmare or any dream. So I, I encourage people to re-enter their dream and tell it as if it's happening in the moment from the inside. And then once you're in a dream, um, you know, the, if you pick up a bunch of different senses, not just what you see, but also what you hear and can touch and can smell, then you become immersed in it. It's as if you're dreaming again. 
and the dream comes alive. Uh, Jenlin said this, a dream is alive. And then it's, it's really um, a very much a relationship between the dreamer and the dream that's dynamic. I feel like it's a living process that opens up, that the dream itself isn't just what you wrote down. It's not a static event, event that, that stays the same. So when you interact with it and go back into it, embody different places or just you know experience it again letting it play forward because i think all dreams are gonna they keep going even when we're not dreaming them is how i see it then we have an experience of the dream that really is it's like a, it's like another another way of living almost another like an alternate reality a little bit like the ultimate um, virtual reality because when you're in a dream it's not like you can distinguish between the dream and reality, you know, when you're actually having a dream, how very real they feel. So if you enter into that state, then there's, there's this wonderful way you can pick up the wisdom from your dreams and you can enter into this place where anything is possible. It feels mm -hmm. like a, a, a very um, magical state, a hopeful state. So, um, and if there are troublesome things that show up in dreams and repeat, this is a way of going into them and addressing them directly um, by asking, you know, asking maybe the dream, the dream, um, the, the dream characters that are frightening, what they're wanting. Why do they keep coming? Why do they keep visiting? Are they trying? Usually, when you turn toward them, and you're calm and you're curious, like a focusing attitude, they will respond by calming down and not being so aggressive, and will tell you what the trouble is. And so mm -hmm. you can resolve some very deep, 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 deep emotional wounds and scars that that our dreams carry for us. They, mm -hmm. they really pick up on, I think, very important, deep emotional um, experiences that we may or may not be consciously aware of and really mm -hmm. um, hold on to those for us and show them what we need to understand and to move forward. I feel like they're, they're that important. Yes, that's wonderful that you, I mean, your work is really helping people access and be in touch with something that we tend to not want to go toward, right? Exactly, yes. So, um, so I'm curious about when did you start to be curious about dream? When did it start? Did it start when you were a little girl? Did you start? When did I was it? always a big daydreamer and uh, um, I was always interested in my dreams and in fantasy and I spent hours staring out the windows, you know, I was always in, in some sort of an other world and I loved imaginative play and writing stories. And so it's always been an interest of mine, although I didn't necessarily have um, a way to articulate it. I was always interested in the unseen realm and magic and that, you know, that, um, and dreams um, then became like, I, I, I took um, when I was in my, Yes, it would be t late twenties. I started studying Jung, and then and then went back to school and did Jungian training, and also did my own Jungian therapy. So did a lot of my own dream work and and making art from dreams and really diving into the whole realm. And it feels to me like um, life is a little bit flat and uninteresting if you're not if you don't have access to this imaginal realm, which is a whole world. Uh, you know, that's, that's just as real in some ways as our waking life. It's just, it's a different, it's a different way. Like, it's like we have m different modes of being and it's a mode of being that focusing is like that too. It's a very um, unseen realm, but it, 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 it opens and opens like a felt sense to, um, to this rich world of, of possibility. And somebody said this, um, um, this, this idea, which I like to repeat, uh, Ruben Neyman is his name and he writes about dreams and he said you know that we're always dreaming and it's like the it's like the stars the stars are always there even if we don't see them um, at night we can see them but during the day we don't see them it doesn't mean they're not there and I think of the dream world like that it's always there um, informing our um, our lives it, it, it actually I think the imaginal world and the the, um, the felt sense informs how we live, but we're not always conscious of it. And and I feel like the more conscious we become of it, the more respectful we are of it. The the larger, the larger a self we become, the more um, 
we incorporate um I don't know how I don't really have words for this I start to get it starts to get a little beyond my ability to express but I think you know what I mean it, like it makes it it makes the world mm -hmm. a much larger world and our self a much larger mm -hmm. self that comes from Jinlin that idea yeah, yeah. it sounds like the by it's like the microcosm to microcosm right by helping someone be or embrace the night dream and the imagination during the day, the daydreaming and all that con unconscious, subconscious consciousness, it expands our consciousness in a micro level. So I'm assuming, and maybe that's part of your vision or it, yeah. you know, it would, is this a way to expand our world consciousness? Yes, I believe so. I believe mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I think especially when you enter into dream the characters that are other and you get this completely different take on a situation, it it you you have a much larger perspective than, you know, in the the um I always say this, the dream ego, you know, our the the I in the dream, the the character that looks like us and we think is us in a dream is only one very small aspect of a dream and it usually represents a kind of a narrow one it's usually the dream ego is usually a bit troubled they're usually kind of fumbling around lost <laughs> and um um they're they're i think very much like a, a, a very aligned with our habitual consciousness or our persona or the way we present ourselves in the world what how we see ourselves which is you know it's it's a it's a slice of a dream but there's all the other characters and all the other um landscapes and the whole world of a dream which is so expansive and mysterious and magical that anything can enter into your dream anything can happen in a dream and so when you when you feel into the whole of a dream you feel into the landscape or the other characters you're um, expanding your consciousness and mm. it 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 I think over time it really changes you and I notice that people become uh, more and more spiritual over time and more their dreams become more spiritual and their dreams become more friendly because mm. at first you're right they we often dream about the things we've repressed and the things we don't want to look at um, the things that need attention that we would rather not <laughs> look at and uh, so there it's a bit uncomfortable to turn toward your dreams but over time they become such an ally they become so rich right right that's wonderful i i um i start i find a book this morning because i really want to write some of my dreams <laughs> good i've inspired you <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah inspired. exactly yeah. to be more with that world and and find um yeah more there there's so, a lot more there's yeah. always more yeah. it's like a felt sense you know how there's always a sense of more you open it and open it and as it yeah. opens there's more and it just feels limitless mm -hmm. exactly. wonderful do you have something else that you'd like to share that we haven't i mean i'm sure there's a lot you know, I think um, we've gone, I think Lynn wanted a half an hour. I think we've, I think we've given her um, lots. I mean, she might even make two videos given that we went a little over time. So I think, yeah, I mean, we could do this again. Maybe if, if, if she, if Lynn is looking for more material, I have always got, I can always talk for, for hours this about is this. wonderful. Yeah, it might be nice to have some vignettes at some mm -hmm. point, another time. Maybe some actual um, dream work, you know, maybe to bring yeah. in a dream and... Yeah. Exactly, yeah. that would be beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Okay. Well, thank so, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This, this was such a sweet conversation. <laughs>